I'm Tamara, and this is TELUS Talks with Tamara Taggart. We're bringing together experts, thinkers, and leaders, busting myths, sharing stories, and staying connected when Canadians need it the most. We're having unexpected conversations for unprecedented times. Hello, I am so excited to be talking to Bill Burnett and Dave Evans today. For those of you who don't know who these two guys are, these two guys, they are engineers, they are um, designers, they are authors, best-selling authors. And uh, I I don't know if there's anyone out there who hasn't heard of Designing Your Life, but you guys have uh, changed a lot of lives. So welcome, Bill, Dave, welcome. Thank you. Nice Great to be, to be here. here. So now let's let's uh, pretend that there's someone out there that hasn't heard of the book uh, "Designing Your Life." I found your book two years ago when um, I lost my job after 30 years in the same in the same. Uh, I was in media for 30 years, and I lost my job. And the first thing my friend Peter told me to do was go buy "Designing Your Life," and I, I got to tell you, I couldn't read it at first. It took me quite a while to read it. And I think that I just had this sort of um, like a real block to anybody telling me how to design my life when I knew exactly what my life was supposed to be career wise. Do you get that a lot, Dave? Sure. I mean, you know, we we snuck up on trying to write down the answer to that question, in my case, for about 40 years. Um, this thing began, when, you know, back in the 70s when I was a college sophomore and was pretty frustrated uh, at trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life and got what I thought was criminally negligently lousy counsel from just about everybody, including the professionals. Um, and then, you know, years go by and we start figuring things out. And Bill and I, in a variety of ways, both professionally, educationally, and personally, have been in this kind of conversation with lots of people. And it's a big, scary question. You know, we, we, we try to help people ask, uh, answer the poetess's question, what will you do with the rest of your one wild and wonderful life? Well, hey, it's my life. It's a big deal. And if it's particularly a question I'm struggling with or it wasn't going well and I'd like it to go better, it, it can be a daunting question. So I don't think you're alone in having bought the book and then put it over there a respectful distance away for, you know, two weeks to two years. Yeah, it took me about two years to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, Bill, it's funny because you teach you you teach this course at at Stanford, and so you're you are designing. People are learning how to design their life when they're in university. Yeah, and that's really where where this started. Dave uh, had been doing a class that was a little bit different but similar over at Berkeley, um, and dropped by my office so 2007 and said, "I'd really like to not drive to Berkeley. He lives way out on the beach." Um, do you want to do a class at Stanford? And I said, yes, but let's do it around design. And, you know, one thing I'd say right up front is we, we tell people in the beginning of the class, we're not going to should on you. We don't tell you what you should do or what, how you should live. Our rule is no shooting. Um, and uh, we're going to give you ideas and tools, but you're the designer. Well, I'm not, the, I'm not, I can't design your life. You're, you're the designer. The autonomy rests entirely with you. And so what I think people when they get into the system a little bit or they think they start reading the book or they take the class and they try some of the exercises, they realize, Oh, wow. One, this is doable. This isn't that hard. And two, I am the designer. Uh, I'm the creative agent in this process. And once that cycle gets going, I think then people, the tendency is then they finish the book. They get very excited about the book. They buy four more books like your friend, Peter, and they hand them to their friends. And, um, and it turns out that it is pretty useful because we don't tell you what to do. But we enable you to figure out, you know, the, something that that will work for you that might have been in there anyway. You just didn't have a way of of teasing it out. Mm-hmm. And and when you describe, you know, in the book about its design, and and that's that's something that we can really wrap our heads around, especially like things in threes. Like I really I clicked into that right because that's something I've always heard, you know, right. and. And so when, you know, you talk about your optimized life, your alternate life and your fascinated life. So can, can one of you talk about those three things? Well, yeah, Tamara, what you're referring to, the, the centerpiece exercise in the book is what we call the Odyssey Plan, where you come up with three completely different versions of the next five years of your life. And that exercise, you know, is a combination of our anthropology and our design methodology. 
So design thinking, which is the, the, the root construct that all this is predicated on, uh, its formal technical term uh, is human-centered design. You know, begun back in the 60s at Stanford. You know, we're, we're in the third generation of design educators at Stanford, just the first ones to apply it to designing ourselves, not just products. Um, and in that human-centered design, we're trying to get two things right. Humanly do the design process. How do designers think and ideate and collaborate and innovate and all that kind of good stuff, which are what we're well known for, and how to make things that really work for human beings and really work for them. And so the whole idea of if I'm going to help you design a better human you, well, how do humans actually work? And what we observed is that all people contain more aliveness than one lifetime permits us to live, i.e. there is more than one Tamara in there. Um, so, of course, there's more than one idea about your future life. None of us is going to get around to living all of ourselves. We're going to pick which of ourselves that we think might be interesting and the world might permit at a particular point in time and do that multiple times. But nobody's going to get done. So that Odyssey plan exercise doesn't want to answer the question, what should you do? Is this the one passion for your life? We don't think there are singular answers. Like, what would be a couple of things you might do? And what are a variety of ways you could live authentically and energetically into the world? And now let's go experiment with those uh, by doing prototyping. And I'll stop there. Um, but the whole idea of there's more than one of you, so you have to have more than one idea. We're just trying to go with the flow of what it means to be a human being as we anthropologically understand what that means. And most most help systems go too far with the one right answer, your singular purpose in the world. And that singularity scares people. Mm. Yeah, because you're not, it's not, it's, would you describe it as self-help? Well, you know, when we, uh, when we first set out to do the book, <laughs> when, we, when, we, when we set out to do the book and we got a wonderful, wonderful editor, Vicki Wilson at Knopf, um, I said, you know, Vicki, this is a design book. I'd really like it in the design aisle. And Vicky said, no, it's a self-help book. No one buys design books, Bill. Um, and so I think, you know, by category, yeah, we fit in the self-help. Or also in the job um, job advice column, we were number one or two in the Amazon job books for a right. while. There, but I, I think it's, it's really, it, really is, it really is self-help. They're like, you do the work. We just yeah. give you the, the prompts and the ideas and back to this, I, it's all based on design and design thinking. That's really all I know how to do. I teach most of my classes. I teach designers how to become designers, you know, young uh, undergrads and grad students. So it's all it's all about using these tools to be effectively the best version of you you can be. So mm -hmm. we don't do the self help. You do it. Right. And I mean, I asked that question. Sorry, Dave. I, I asked that question because I don't think it is a self help book. And but when I got the book. I thought I was being given a self-help book, but I, I, it's not a self-help book. It's definitely not. And when you look through it and the exercises you have to do, they're, they're difficult. Uh, I mean, I find some of them difficult, but I don't find it to be a self-help book. Sorry, Dave, did you want to add to that? Yeah, because we thought about that a little. What, what are we not? Uh, there are two things. First of all, somebody tried to coin a new category called science help meaning I'm going to help myself, but I'm going to use it standing on a foundation of scientifically validated methodologies rather than just kind of goofy stuff. I think the reason, one good reason the self-help category um, has maybe a lower credibility than others um, is that an awful lot of people in it just made a bunch of stuff up out of nowhere, uh, but they're good at communicating in an attractive way, an inspirational way. Um, so a lot of people telling you what to do, but enthusiastically, and that just doesn't work. We, we think most of those things fall in one of three categories, and we try very carefully not to be any of them. Uh, one is they're just a diagnostic tool. I now have a four-letter acronym to describe my personality, and it feels so settling. Um, it is prescriptive. Here's the four things to do to become you know, skinny, sexy, and run twice as fast as you used to. Um, <laughs> or it's just inspirational. You can do it. You can be your amazing gold medal self. You know, Now, those aren't invalid. Thing, diagnostics are useful and, and, and lists are not bad. Um, we even have one, but, you know, and inspiration's okay, but all by themselves, they're quite insufficient. And usually they leave you worse than you started because they don't work, followed by, man, it must be me. Here's this popular book and I tried it and I even failed. I'm not even good enough at helping myself. So we focused on doable hopeful stuff. We call it the set the bar low and clear it method. We, we really are trying to give people things that, can't, that they can make work for themselves. 
We don't guarantee outcomes. We don't guarantee an epiphany or suddenly the world's going to pay twice as much for poets as it used to. We, 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 don't, we don't promise changing reality. We, yeah. we try to give you tools to help you navigate reality more effectively. So there's and no magic. Do we don't right. do magic. I do appreciate the tools. So let's talk about some tools and let's talk about your, you know, designing your COVID life. And uh, mm. that's something that you guys have been uh, talking about. I've watched all your videos on it and I really appreciate it because this is a scary time for everyone for so many reasons. There are millions of people that are um, out of work right now. Lots of people don't know if they will have a job to go back to or what it will look like. Um, you know, people are feeling scared, uh, uh, hopeless. Um, and I guess it's that uncertainty of, of where we're all at, right? So this is, it's right. scary times. And, and it's easy to think, oh gosh, I'm never going to find a job now. And, uh, and I don't know even if I want to go back to my old job. So let's, let's start talking about designing your COVID life. We start with, um, I mean, can we design our life during COVID? So jump in on, on um, generative or radical acceptance, I think. And let's blow that out because that really is the place to start. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of people, um, there was an article, I think they said you, it was in the um, Harvard Business Review on grief. We're going yeah. through a cycle of grief, you know, and the Kubler-Ross grief cycle is denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and finally acceptance. And I think we're a lot of people are in anger, denial, <laughs> and depression right now. But uh, people keep talking about the new normal, and we say no. The first the step zero in design design thinking for our design, version of design thinking is accept. We live in reality. You got to accept the reality that we are living in. And right now, radical acceptance of reality is the step one because. Until you get over being angry um, and maybe you lost your job or maybe you lost your business. You know, if you're, I live in the city here in a neighborhood called the Dog Patch. Lots of small business owners here. This could be an existential crisis for them. They, they may never come back. The restaurants, the little shops, you know, the folks selling whatever knickknacks, you know, it's just they may never come back. So first you got to start with accept and um, you can't there's there's kind of suppressing your feelings you know, oh, uh, well, I just got it out. There's feeling like you've been victimized. You're oppressed. You know, oh, my God, you know, this is ho most horrible. I guess I have to accept it. Oh, my God, what do I do? Um, another, none of those make, leave you feeling creative or leave you feeling energized. So we're much more on the radical acceptance. We want to engage the world. And to engage the world, we have to decide this is just normal now. And that we're thinking of that it's going to, this will end and then it'll be like it was before is pretty magical thinking, I think, but it's also not useful because we don't know what it's going to be like. And the uncertainty and everything is what's causing a lot of the uh, anxiousness. So starting with just accept and where can I engage the world to find something that I can have agency over is kind of step one. You know, and, and, and doubling down on this acceptance thing, I mean, if that's actually all we discussed here, it might be the most value-add thing we could do because, um, you know, the, book is the books are organized around dysfunctional beliefs um, that we provide reframes to. And, uh, and so on the Odyssey plan, for instance, you know, the dysfunctional beliefs, there's one perfect life for me and I have to figure it out before it's too late. And the reframe is there's lots of good use. There's no one perfect you. Let's go try some out. Okay, so that's a reframe. And in a classic, and by the way, a lot of classic beliefs, um, I mean, have certain kind of merit that are mostly misunderstood and in so doing mostly dangerous. Mm -hmm. So classic line, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So when life gives you COVID, well, make COVID laid or something, you know. Um, <laughs> Here's the problem with that metaphor. The metaphor says, you know, when you get a crummy thing, find a way to make something good out of the crumminess. I mean, that, that we're going to take lemons, which are really bitter. I'm going to make that into something else. Literally, gonna, I'm going to transform the crummy into great. Mm -hmm. There is nothing great about COVID. Yeah. Absolutely nothing great about people dying right and left and a massive pandemic and, and countries not being prepared for it. You know, trying to make, you know... Um, the best of a bad situation, okay, but making lemonade out of that lemons, no, that's not the place to go. So when we talk about radical acceptance or generative acceptance, it means accepting things in a way that frees you to do something you can do. In so doing, we are not pretending for a minute that it's okay. Acceptance and endorsement are completely different. 
some people morally, ethically get confused. Like, well, I mean, if I accept this, that means I think it's okay. No, we don't think it's okay. It's just true. Mm-hmm. So a lot of things that are true, they're not okay. So you're not giving up your moral stance. Um, and you are saying, I'm going to find a way to live as alively as I can in the face of this. I'm not saying it's going to be just like before. It's not going to be better than. Or, I mean, it's just taking things as they come. Yeah. Which I think introduces us for COVID. Maybe to the next idea is, um, you know, we talk about getting stuck. And two classic categories of getting stuck are anchor problems and gravity problems. A gravity problem is a problem that's not really a problem because you can't do anything about it. Gravity doesn't, you know, my, my problem is gravity. I'm 67 now and I gained 20 pounds I don't want, you know, because I'm sitting home looking at Zoom, eating things I shouldn't. Um, and um, so, hey, Bill, help me with my gravity problem. Well, there's no solution there. If you can't act on it, it's not a problem. It's a circumstance. You accept it and you move on. Mm-hmm. That's a gravity problem. People often complain about things that are unchangeable. Then there's an anchor problem where you weigh yourself down by framing your question as equaling one answer and one answer only that you can't have. Now, the classic anchor problem people have right now is we're hearing this a lot, particularly from young prof- young people. Hey, Bill and Dave, you know, I'm, I'm stuck. I'm coming out of school and, and I was going to get the, my internship got canceled. So how do I make myself look so attractive that people hire me anyway, even though everybody shut down? And mm-hmm. the question really is, how do I come up with a trick so that I don't personally have any impact from this COVID thing? I'd like to be the person that gets away with it. Can you help me do that? Well, if that's what you want... Boy, I, I don't ha- have that magic wand up my sleeve. And if that's the only thing you're willing to have is I'd like my old life back just now, that's an anchor problem that's going to be really hard to find a solution to as opposed to, well, are you willing to go explore what different versions of your 2021 self the world might permit you to have and then find ways to go have that one? That's an actionable problem um, that, again, depends on that acceptance so there are anchor problems and gravity problems. And right now, a lot of people are stuck on things that they're not going to be able to get unstuck from. So they need a, a reframe. I don't know, Bill, if mm-hmm. you want to talk about what reframes are. But... Well, I know I was uh, right, because yeah. the dysfunctional beliefs that you talk about through through your book, um, I, everybody has dysfunctional beliefs. Sure. I, I mean, my day is filled with I, I didn't realize how much, you know, I, I, how many dysfunctional beliefs I had about myself, about my abilities, about so many things, and then reframing it into, and it's, it's not hard to do. You just have to be uh, conscious of, of, yeah. or aware of that dysfunctional belief and be able to identify it right away. But when you talk about, um, you know, acceptance. So it's just accepting the reality that we are in right now with COVID-19, right? It's not, it, well, that, not well, that, being in and, denial. Is that? No, it's not, it's not denial. And it's with, see, and acceptances need a reframe to become actionable. So let's say I accept that I'm not going to be able to pull off the plan I had last October. Right. And now, so I'm not going to be able to get a job, you know, right away because the pe- the kind of companies I was looking at aren't hiring now until they figure out what they're doing. Say, okay, my goal is not like, how do I get hired anyway? Mm. No, my reframe is, how do I position myself so that when the hiring starts, I might be on the top of the pile? Right, right. So Bill, and now, and and we have a, and we have a processor that the bill can explain. <laughs> well, it's, but but you you did you know I think it's accept, but it's also awareness, right? What's what? Almost every one of our little tools, and they, they don't take that long. You can do most of them in ten minutes. Start with, where am I right now? And honestly, where am I right now? How am I feeling? How am I doing? On um, any one of these metrics, what's my what's my sense of myself? Because if we're ca- trying to change, we got to know where we're starting from. There's a big sign over the design studio called, that says, "You are here," and it's there to remind the students that design starts in reality. If you take the dust cover off the book, it's also on the inside on the cover. Mm-hmm. And then it's a, it's a, a pre, we started with a pretty simple four step process. You get curious because curiosity is a mindset of designers. Designers are in, innately curious about the world. You find something you're interested in. You go talk to people. Hey, what is really going? I tell you, it turns out this job thing, when I started talking to people, it's kind of lumpy. I've been out talking to lots of executives. Some companies are hiring just like before. Some companies are honoring everybody they've, 
already made an offer to and slow, kind of slowing down to see what happens. And some come if you're Lyft or Uber or Airbnb, you're just collapsing. OK, so it's just lumpy. So you get out there, you get curious, you talk to people and then you try stuff. You prototype your way into the future because by running little experiments on the future, you can discover kind of what's going on. And then you tell your story. You know, you, you, you talk to people and tell your story and that story comes back to you. And other people getting curious about you because, you know, if you're, if you're a good storytelling, your storyteller, you're a pretty interesting person and now people will be curious about you. So you go around this cycle, getting curious, talking to people, trying stuff, telling your story. And, and pretty soon, um, you are doing actionable things. You are meeting people who might have, if your job's the thing you're looking for, that might have opportunities or might know about a project you could do. Maybe it's not a job. Maybe it's a project. The reframe is it's not forever. It's just, it's just a project. And our, our classic thing for students who really want to get a job in a really hard place to get a job. And there's lots of those for getting COVID. Like, I want to work for Francis Ford Coppola. I want to work for George Lucas. I want to work for, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Lady Gaga. Well, there are ways to do that. <laughs> They're hard, and you got to be a little bit innovative. But how about that free internship? Anybody ever turn down a free intern? No. And if it's a strategy, not just a way of getting ripped off for your time, it can be really effective. So there's lots of little strategies in the book, but mostly it's, Get curious, to, you know, talk to people, try stuff, and tell your story. And once you get out there with that kind of generative, curious mindset of a designer, uh, our experience is good stuff happens. Mm -hmm. And it does. I mean, it has to with curiosity and good stories, right? I've always believed that. So what about with COVID, our COVID life? And, um, you know, we talk about the toolbox and all the things that we need um, how do we do that? How do I tell my story? How do I get curious? How do I um, hear other stories if I'm locked in my house and I have been for 50 days? Yeah. Well, it turns out it's in one way, um, it's never been easier to have conversations with people you don't know than it is right now. Right. Um, because everybody's stuck at home and, you know, they're more, they're, nobody's commuting. They have more time. They're lonely. An awful lot of people are living alone, um, you know, and they're doing, this. they're doing this Zoom conversation thing. And again, we so we're really advocating the, the talk to people aspect of reaching out, which is not merely. And by the way, those are not transactional conversations. They're exploratory. Get the story. You know, so so Tamara, so tell me, what's it like doing this thing, this podcast thing, what have you? And what was the what was that migration from finally reading the book till now? Um, you know, let's hear that story now. Hey, have you got a job for me? You know, mm -hmm. if you ask the transactional question, you get a no. If you ask the story question, you get an engagement. And right now you can reach out to people who are complete strangers using this thing called LinkedIn. LinkedIn has established a whole new social contract with billions of people, literally billions of people, um, who are potentially available. We had one young woman we worked with who took us seriously on this point, And she was interested in talking to people who are doing impact in investing in Asia, in boutique firms. And she was in the States. She had 150, 150 Skype conversations with people she had never met. I said, my gosh, how many contacts did you have to initiate to get 150 people to actually talk to you? She said, about 200. So I said, holy cow, that means more than half of your reachings out cold calls on Skype got people coming back and said, sure, I'll talk to you in person. And that was exactly three-fourths of the people she called talked to her on the first ask. Wow. And that was before COVID. But, you know, in, in the COVID thing, I'll tell you, um, I like to bring people into my classes. I'm teaching, you know, I mentioned before we got on the air, teaching four classes. I've got the CEO of, of one of the big three auto companies coming to class. I've got the CEO of a major social network coming to class. And I have a world famous designer who even David Kelly can't get to come to class, mm. coming to class. Because I reached out and I said, hey, can you give me, you know, 45 minutes of your time, maybe, you know, 30 minutes to talk and 15 minutes of questions? Would you like to meet some start smart Stanford students? And they all said yes. And there's no way they would have had the time for this pre-COVID. So, you know, it, it is it isn't lemonade and it's still bitter and it's still lonely. Right. But there are but some there are some positives. things that are. Yeah, there are some things that you can do that you could never have done before. None of these none of these guys would have flown to Stanford and and, and taken a you know, time out of their day. 
Bill, tell the tell the back door story because that relates to this. You may not be able to land a job right now, but you can land yourself in a place where one might come your way sooner than to the next person. Well, I mean, it's you know, it's, uh, I was talking to uh, the head of design at a, a very very large Fortune five, Fortune fifty company, Fortune ten probably, and I said, I was just checking in. How are you guys doing? Everything's fine. What's the, what's the business climate like? Well, you know, lots of people are putting things on hold, but we're doing okay. What are you doing for hiring? Because I've got some students that I think would be really great. And he said, well, officially, we have a hiring freeze. He says, but I'm still recruiting for women and underrepresented minorities. You got anybody in that category? I will put them on top of the pile. And I said, well, I happen to have both. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have a woman and I have an underrepresented minority in my graduate class. Would you like to see their resumes? He said, give them to me personally. This is the senior vice president of everything at a very large company. He said, I will make sure they get interviewed. So, again, going out and just talking to people. Now, I mean, I, I'm, I'm doing this because I want to help my students find places to go. But it wouldn't have been impossible for someone to get a 30-minute Skype call with this, this person. He's, um, you know, almost everybody's available. You can find an email and yeah. you can... And you can make a pitch. And in the case of our, our student, uh, we do find that about 70 to 75 percent of the time, if you're asking for the story and you're, and you're genuinely curious, you can't be pretending to ask for a story and really looking for a job. You got to be asking for the story. The best way to get a job is not to look for jobs. Ask for the story. Be curious. You'll have a conversation. Seven to ten of these conversations into it, you'll have you'll be visible in a network of insiders who who know where if there are any opportunities and there aren't as many as there used to be but if there are you'll you'll you have a yep. chance of coming to the top of the pile absolutely okay so i am one of those people that has very high standards i have high standards for myself i have high standards for everybody around me uh it's why my husband says i'm disappointed often because my <laughs> standards are too high for the people around me um <laughs> So you guys say, and you say this also with our designing our COVID life to set the bar low. Right. What does that mean? Uh, it means, it means two things. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a tactical version of that and there's a strategic version of that. And um, uh, in particular in our new book, Designing Your Work Life, we talk about this. So um, uh, Bill, I'll take good enough and then I'm going to pitch to you the set the bar. Okay. Okay. So yeah. there's, a, there's kind of a macro set the bar low. Okay. Um, and, and which is not, not exactly what you're referring to, but there's a, a whole chapter in the new book talking about a reframe of, you know, hey, if this isn't good enough, you know, so if you've got, I've got really, this isn't good enough. Yeah, but is it good enough for now? So we recognize that if we believe in growth and things change over time, you know, I want to both have a high standard. I want to have excellence in my life. And I also want to live in real time and realize you can't get everything immediately then in general, we're talking about, you know, like, like you know, this COVID thing. I mean, I'm, we're still sheltering in place. You know, this is not the way I want to live. This is not good enough. Okay, but can I find a way to make it good enough for now? I mean, the, you know, through May, if we do it this way, is that good enough for that circumstance? And then if it is, that is literally good enough. And I'm leaning into the satisfactoriness, not the disappointedness. I'm looking at what is, not what isn't. And then I renew that deal. I re-up it, you know, four weeks from now, six weeks from now. And I'm cutting deals with myself and the universe on a regular basis. Good enough for now, version one. Good enough for now, version two. Repeat a couple thousand times. Then you die. Then you're good. Um, but the point being, it's an, it's an incrementalism that has everything to do with mindset, right? Mm. Um, now, the set the bar low method relative to how we actually develop things and do prototyping, that's that's probably the number one design idea. So let's go to the number one design program in the university world on the planet's director, Bill Burnett, and see how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, look, if you look, if you look at, um, what's it, 90% of uh, New Year's resolutions have failed by March. Certainly by by May, we're all, but it's just mm-hmm. failed. Because people try to do things that are too hard. You know, I'm going to run a marathon this year. It's like, well, I'm looking at your phone, Dave, and you're not even doing 5,000 steps. I, uh, between here and a marathon, <laughs> not just not possible, right? Um, and if you look at the science of behavior change, you have to break behaviors into very small increments, something that you can actually accomplish in, you know, five to 10 days. 
and then you can celebrate your accomplishment. Or if you don't meet the goal, you can reset the goal and try something even simpler. But you build up um, to the marathon, to the weight loss, to the more optimistic view of the world in very small steps. Uh, in fact, one of our colleagues, BJ Fogg, who runs BJ Fogg, who runs a lab here at Stanford on behavior change, just wrote a book called Tiny Habits, uh, and it's all about you know how do you how do you actually create the the triggers for a new behavior, get rid of the things that that lock you into the old behaviors, and it's about taking very small steps. So it sounds cute, set the bar low and clear it, but it's actually, you know, it's based in science. It's the only way you make significant change in your life. And by the way, it takes six to eight weeks before you can displace an old habit or or start a new one. So it's going to take a while. Mm -hmm. So do you guys think that there are there, is there opportunity during this pandemic when people are staying home and feeling anxiety and applying these, you know, steps, is there opportunity here for uh, really coming out of this, um, you know, not a different person or a change person, not that, but just, you know, the opportunity of even, even if it's just getting out of bed and doing those small things that eventually, because it can be quite, you can get quite down when you're inside all the time or when you're, yeah. So uncertain, right? So, I'm, and we've we're lost, looking... we've lost all the markers. Like, I don't get up and get on the train anymore. I don't, I don't have the things that change the, the light in the room or the light in the day. So I don't know where I exactly. am. Exactly. What yeah. time of day is it? And what day is it? And yes, it's very, it's very, very. So difficult. what, what opportunities to, you know, just, you know, the average person that's that's, you know, hearing you guys for the first time, what opportunities do you see for for people right now? Well, I th first of all, I think we I think we want to be really respectful um, of people who are encountering this moment in time in radically different ways, depending on circumstance. I mean, just in, in in my own life directly. I mean, so you know, my wife and I have five adult children, four are married. You know, we've got eight grandkids. We've got a lot of people's lives we're watching. You know, um, I've got one daughter-in-law who's in the hospitality industry, and she and 90% of the employees at her large retreat center have been furloughed and laid off, and they have no idea when they can start stuff back up again. And she just had her second child. Mm. I got another son-in-law who is on the one of the internal tools team development organization um, groups at Netflix, and they're working their butts off and feeling like we're trying to help people retain their sanity and feeling great about themselves. Mm. Um, I've got a, one of my, um, there's a, a special program called Distinguished Career Institute at Stanford that I teach in. And one of my clients who's a, you know, 57 year old palliative MD counselor, been doing that kind of work for many years is remotely, um, dialing into her hospital in Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, where she is spending time with dying patients who are going to die alone because their families can't come in and see them in COVID. Mm -hmm. And after 20 years of doing that kind of difficult, you know, hospice palliative work, this is overwhelming her. Okay, so these are three people in really different circumstances. So how should they design their moment? Well, let's, I think yeah. I want to start with, look, people, we're, we're not trying to trivialize anything here. So thing one is, that, so given where you happen to be, like, so my, my daughter-in-law that's laid off, what does she do? Okay, she's going to have to make a deal with herself. Either I'm going to start deciding to change industries and try to get into high tech while I'm unemployed, you know, with no access and no experience, or I'm going to find a way to wait. I'm going to probably try to wait this thing out and see if we can't be part of the restarted hotel industry, you know, 90 days from now or 100 days from now. Um, and in the meantime, boy, I, I'm going to get an extended time at home with my, my five and one year old child. Mm. And, and my husband and I are going to get really good at eating rice and beans you know, or whatever it might be. So, I mean, let's focus in on what's the good enough for now that makes sense for me. And then the, I think the critical thing is back to my, managing mindset. It's one of the mm -hmm. keys during COVID is to re-remember, this is all I'm trying to do now. It's not going to last forever because the very expensive thing is to wake up and look out the window and go, oh my God, is the pandemic still on? Mm. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, um, and, uh, and we pay the emotional bill of the whole thing landing on us like a landslide every single day. And we're trying to help people not repay that emotional bill because it's expensive enough just to deal with the reality you've accepted, much less having to start it all over again. Yeah, yeah that two, makes uh, a lot of sense. Two, two personal stories. Um, I bet you've never had cleaner closets. 
<laughs> I've been cleaning closets. I've been cleaning yes. the garage. I've organized boxes of papers I haven't opened since high school. Yes. You know, so when this is all done, I am going to be tidied up. It's uh, always been my dream to be organized, and now I am. There you are. Okay. <laughs> and then, you know, on a, on, a, on a more, maybe more serious note, um, uh, just before they locked down all the uh, assisted living homes, my mom passed away. And oh, we, luckily, sorry. we were all there when she passed in, in early March. And so the family was all there, and we, we came out of there with boxes and boxes of photographs and letters and all sorts of things. And my mom took a, um, when she was earlier, healthier, she took a autobiography class. And we found both in her papers and on her computer, about 20 chapters of her autobiography. Wow. Now that's something that would be on Bill's to-do list, organize mom's, mom's story. I would, yeah, it would have been on my to-do list and in a busy time, I would have gotten to that somewhere, oh, uh, 2025 maybe. Mm. But I'm, I'm, I'm putting together the history of my mother for my for my kids for her grandkids. That's um, amazing, and, and it's and it's just amazing to find this stuff. And so, what have I got? I've got extra time. Yes. I'm not on the train three hours a, a right. week a day, and I and I've got uh, and I've got to find a way to separate work, yeah, and not work. Right. So, right, right. I, I have uh, you mentioned my paintings. I have more time in the studio, and I have more time. I can't. We can't have a. a we can't have a memorial service for my mom. We can't all go to the cemetery and, you know, put her ashes in the wall. But I can do this with my brothers and sisters, and that can be our way of processing what we need to do right. in the only way that's available. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, a really uh, beautiful story of how, you know, to tell her story and what a gift she left you. Turns out she was a very good writer. Well, there you go. That's so amazing. Brilliantly written. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So um, I, a personal question. Uh, you were going to do um, Designing Your Life for Women. That was on your website. There was going to be a retreat, I think. Oh, there are. Yeah. There's a whole workshop. That but been going obviously, on for, I know. So I'm wondering, yeah. like, are you doing online things still? Or like, because obviously people aren't meeting for retreats in person. Mm-hmm. Have you guys thought about yeah, that? Well, we- We've had to cancel those retreats. Those are taught by um, uh, the head of our lab, Kathy Davies, and another person. Yes. Because they're for women. We, we can't be there. Yes. Um, and then uh, we were doing coaches' workshops. We are certifying coaches. We did a few personal workshops. I was in Thailand over the summer doing workshops, in Japan doing workshops. Yeah, that's all That's all been put on hold. Um, are I those think things we're now that be- can happen online, though, Bill? You know? Yeah, I think they can. I mean, I'm, I'm teaching Designing Your Life at Stanford. I teach in the spring quarter. And I'm, that's all online. It's 60 students. But we're still having a, right. a very engaged kind of it, – it's, it's not just, you know, lectures, blah, 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 on, no. on Zoom or Skype. You have to change it. But I think it can yeah. be changed. And Dave and I just started talking about how could we, how could we keep the Designing Your Life movement and the Designing Your Life community going. Right. By doing more stuff online. Well, and I, I just, I brought up the designing your life for women because when you, when you watch the video on your website, uh, designing your life for women, uh, yeah. it, it really like, there was just something about that video. My girlfriend, Jennifer and I were talking, we were like, okay, we should just like go to this. Like, I think that, you know what I mean? It was really. Yeah. And so then yeah. of course those things aren't happening. So it's just the, uh, I, I, of course, I'm interested in all the other things that you do, but the one for women, I was particularly <laughs> interested in. Well, and I think, I think it really it does, spoke to me. It does point something out. And we, the, the, uh, the, the two women who've been leading, and, and by the way, the, uh, there are a couple of content tunings and a, a fair bit of pace tuning, but the primary programmatic difference between the normal, regular, led by Bill or Dave, design your life intensive workshop for you know working adults who don't go to Stanford, um, and the women's one is that the women's one, it's all women. About 90% of what makes it special is it's just all women in the room. And on something, abs- you know, something, when all guys get together, something happens when all women get together, something different can happen. Um, and the, and mm-hmm. the something different that can happen when all the women get together um, is really generative. Um, and I think one thing that will be interesting, people are going to be studying for a while, you know, as this slows down, but it probably doesn't completely end for a long time. You know, how we're trying to answer the question, how can I make virtual better? A lot. And we're getting pretty good at it. 
But I will, I, I will postulate, and this is totally speculative, that you know we are, in, as Bill loves to say, we are. You're not a brain on a transport system. You are an embodied intelligence. We are incarnational 3D thingettes, you know, uh, with consciousness. And there's something about being together that is not the same as being apart. One hundred percent. And proximity matters. Uh, even psychology now is a thing called mood contagion. We don't just pick up each other's emotions. We actually propagate them. You know, mm. we're more like an aspen forest than a bunch of autonomous beings, uh, i.e. we share a root system. Um, and uh, and some of that um, is, is, we think, kind of important to the design your life experience. So we've been fans of together. We, we were slow to online all along. We were, you know, despite the fact we're pretty good at it. Um, we went to online a lot more slowly than a lot of people wanted to, frankly, because we just highly value the in-person experience. So we'll see where this all heads. Mm -hmm. And having more online tools uh, and available uh, will be probably a smart thing. But, you know, assuming we all don't never get in the same room again, I'm pretty sure we will return to a, a, con a, a congregation of participants as well as a website. I sure hope so. Okay. And just as we wrap up, you have a new book. Your book came out in February of this year. February seems so long ago now, now that it's May. <laughs> um, tell us about uh, it's designing your work life. So uh -huh. just, uh, you know, if somebody's uh, looking at uh, maybe they want to do some reading while they're in isolation, tell us about designing your work life. Well, particularly because it's, um, you know, a time when you, if a lot of people are thinking about work or even changing what they want to do. We, we took a look at the stats and they're horrible. Like 68% of people are in the U.S. don't like their jobs or are deeply um, disengaged from their jobs. 85% of people are disengaged worldwide. Uh, Japan has a 93% disengagement rate. It's crazy. So we were looking at the, you know, we always start with empathy. What's the problem? Well, people really don't like their job and they don't like it because it's boring or they've outgrown it or, or they don't like the company culture or the boss or something. Um, and we, we decided to take a look at that and apply design tools to that. And it turns out when we got into it that you have more agency than you think. You've got more ways of redesigning your job than you think. And a lot of them don't require other people's permission. You can just do them yourself mm. all the way up to, yeah, you could go back to school and learn a new thing, but you don't have to go that far um, to, to significantly in, increase your job satisfaction. So the book is just full of, you know, some more tools and some more ideas about what makes, you know, work, work. Again, we teach at Stanford, so we're not allowed to just make stuff up. This can't yeah. just be <laughs> Bill, and Dave th Bill and Dave think you should be positive. <laughs> no, we go to the work of Martin Seligman and Chuck Sent Mahai exactly. and Dan Gold Goldman and Dan, Gil Dan Gilbert. And, and we, you know, we look at the emotional intelligence research and we try to base our stuff on things that we know have a positive impact on people's psychology. So that's that the book and 80% of your day, you know, your time is spent at work. So why not yeah. take a deep dive on that one? Exactly. Uh, I just want to thank you both so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. It's like I said, Bill, before we started talking, before um, Dave arrived on on Skype here. Um, I feel like I know you guys because I have, you know, I've read your book. I have watched all of your videos and uh, you, you have a lot to offer everybody really like we can apply all of your tools and, um, and uh, find ways to, um, you know, reframe the things in our life that need to be reframed. So thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Very kind. So Tamara, let me, yeah, let me you. finish by asking you a question. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you, now you're into the books. You're calling these guys. You, you even feel like you know us because you actually listened to all those videos. Um, if you could get in a time machine and go back to the lovely young woman you were four months after you'd bought the book the first time. Mm. And, of course, in real reality, it was another you know 18 months until you were going to read it. Yeah. Would you be able to tell her, you know, it's not as scary as you might think. Maybe you could pick the yeah. book up sooner. I wish I would have picked it up sooner. I think I, I think that I – I think I had an idea of what was in the book and I was so wounded and I wasn't ready to go there yet. And I had to be ready. But now that I have been through the book and it's been highlighted and, you know, all of that stuff, I really, truly wish I would have read it earlier. And not only that, you guys, 
um, you don't have to go, you don't have to hate your job or have been let go from your job or anything in order to read this book. Cause this book doesn't apply just to work. It's just about, you know, even as a mother, even as a friend, all of those things, it's just this well-rounded life that yeah. you get to design. And I think that's what we forget is there are so many shoulds in life, right? And we have grown up on the should ofs, the should ofs. And so I'm glad you asked that, Dave, because uh, I I should have read it a long time ago. I wish I would have read it a long time ago. <laughs> we're just we're, we're we're trying to make it easy. A little, we're trying to make a hard thing a little easier. And and, and you and, do and, a good job of it. You really the do. Whole, the whole point of the second book was because a lot of people are, oh, I'm not sure I'm to completely reinvent my life. Well, hey, the second book is really about. Well, would you like it to be a like uh, the life you have now? Even would you like it to be a little bit better? We might be able to help you with that. So, well, and so- and that's a good point too, Dave. Because you know what, I think there are a lot of people that are that are in isolation right now, and mm-hmm. still working from home and doing all of these things, and recognizing right. a lot of the things they were missing, maybe with their kids, or maybe with you know, connections with friends that they didn't have before because they were so busy and they were so, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of gifts in your book and, um, and in your videos where you can find out more about Dave and Bill and about the book, designing your life on their website, designing your dot life and their new book, designing your work life is available now anywhere books are sold. And don't forget to join us here on Tell Us Talks with Tamara Taggart every Tuesday and Thursday. 